Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2022-2023 Islands Matter series. Now, it might surprise you to hear that I am not, in fact, Andrew Jennings. Um, apologies if you were expecting Andrew's cheery face this afternoon. You're stuck with me. My name's uh, Dr. Andrew Lind. I'm a lecturer at the Institute for Northern Studies, and unfortunately, because of a, a power outage um, in Shetland, Andrew is unable to join the session today, but he sends his apologies, and uh, I hope that the, the disruption will be minimal. So before I introduce our speaker this afternoon, I've just got a couple of quick points of, uh, of technical uh, issues that I'll just uh, quickly note. The first is, as you probably heard the scary robot voice suggest, that this, uh, this sorry, um, session is being recorded. So just to make everyone aware of that. The other point I just want to note is that we encourage questions at any point during today's presentation. But if you do want to submit a question, can we ask that you do so via the chat function rather than the Q&A fu function on WebEx? And that just means that um, it will be directed to uh, all panellists and it will just ensure that none of these questions fall through the gaps and we can address them to our speaker. Speaking of which, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Professor Patrick Nunn. Patrick is a professor of geography at the University of the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia. He's a geologist and climate scientist by background, and one of Patrick's current research interests focuses on ancient understandings of coastal environmental change and how these have been culturally filtered and encoded in narrative and myth. This research was laid out in his books, Vanished Islands and Hidden Continents of the Pacific, which was published by the University of Hawaii in 2009, and The Edge of Memory, which was published by Bloomsbury in 2018. His new book out last year from uh, Bloomsbury as well is uh, Worlds in Shadows, Submerged Lands in Science, Memory and Myth. And Patrick will be pulling on several of these themes in today's talk entitled First of Woods and Sign a Sea. Scottish stories of uh, memorable landscape change in their global context. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you very much, Andrew. Okay, well, it's a great honor for me to be here and uh, thank you all for uh, coming. It's uh, just after nine o'clock in the evening here in Australia. So if I start to fade a bit in the next uh, hour or so, uh, please forgive me. Um, but I'm very excited to talk about this, particularly to uh, uh, an audience in Scotland um, it's it's a while since I've been in Scotland, um, but I have always been fascinated by Scottish stories and what people often refer to as myths and legends. And um, as I've been doing elsewhere in the world, um, I've recently published in the Scottish Geographical Journal an analysis of Scottish uh, stories, um, particularly those uh, referring to memorable landscape change, coastal change. Um, and I want to talk about those uh, today and I want to put them in their global context and hopefully I have something interesting um, that, that you will find interesting. So um, I just also want to dedicate this talk to the memory of Professor Michael Tooley who uh, passed away earlier this year. He was a good friend of mine and he was a professor of geology and geography at the University of St Andrews. So Vale Michael. Um, and as is common in Australia, uh, I have to acknowledge, or I want to acknowledge, that this presentation was prepared on the unceded Aboriginal lands of the Kabi Kabi and Jinibara people. Um, and I think it's quite apropos to mention that in that this talk discusses and explains the value of traditional and local knowledge in, in Scotland, um, demonstrating similarities with Australia and elsewhere, which I will touch on briefly in this presentation. So it celebrates this presentation, the wisdom of non-globalized cultures across the world in ways that uh, I've, I have become convinced are, are very important. Um, so the title, um, First a wood and sign a sea, now a moss and I shall be. Um, and um, please forgive my uh, awful pronunciation, but uh, um, obviously wood is wood and sign is then and moss is marsh and I is forever. Uh, you all know this uh, much better than I do. Um, what does that mean? Um, well, it was um, one of the popular rhymes of Scotland that was put together in an 1826 book by uh, Robert Chambers. Um, and this is what he wrote on page eight, and it refers to Lochar Moss. Um, this ancient popular rhyme recalls the revolutions undergone by the territory called Lochar Moss, previous to settling in its present and final character of a peat bog. And it may appear singular, 
it does appear singular, that the modern naturalist accounts for the production of moss in exactly this way. So here he is in 1826 flagging the fact that this popular saying may in fact or does appear um, to recall exactly the way in which um, this particular moss or marsh um, formed. So let's look at it. Where, where is it? It's on the north uh, side of Solway Firth um, in that uh, red rectangle there from Lockhart Briggs uh, right down to the to the sea there. And um, if you go back seven, eight, nine, ten thousand years, that whole area was forested. Um, there was a wood there in exactly the same way as the um, the saying uh, states. But then if you go up to 6,000 years ago, we know the sea level here was about three meters higher. It had encroached on the land. Um, it had changed the coastline completely. Coastline looked uh, looked something uh, like that 6,000 years ago. Um, and then the sea level fell um, relative to the land. Uh, and we got the mosses um, that we find there today, um, from Kansalok Moss uh, in the north down to Lokar and Lady Hall Moss uh, in uh, the south uh, east uh, on this diagram there. All the greens there are, are mosses or, or marshes. Um, so exactly as the rhyme says, 7,000 years or so ago, Lokar Moss was a, a wood, then it became a sea, then it became a marsh. And I asked the question here at the outset, could this rhyme in fact recall 7,000 years of history? Uh, it may seem an extraordinary proposition, um, but let me then take you to the uh, Western United States. And this is um, really one of the most wonderful sites in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Crater Lake in Oregon with Wizard Island there in the middle. Um, it's the remains of a massive uh, conical volcano called Mount Mazama, what we call it Mount Mazama today, um, that blew itself to pieces 7,600 years ago. Um, we know that because we've studied the geology of, of this place. Uh, but what, what is absolutely incredible is that when the first Europeans arrived in this area and they spoke to the Klamath Indian people who lived there, the Klamath had stories about this eruption and the collapse of the volcano and the formation of what today we call Crater Lake. And they had a whole series of culturally grounded taboos about Crater Lake um, that were associated with their stories um, of the collapse of Mount Mazama. So there's no way of getting around this. Um, these memories that the Klamath had 100, 150 years ago um, are have endured for uh, 7,600 uh, years. Let me give you another example from Australia, and these are just preliminary examples, uh, just to sort of give you a sense that um, I am talking about something with um, th th that is credible here. This is Mornington Island um, in northern Australia, and if we uh, look at a map of Mornington Island, you can see it there um, with the Australian mainland uh, on the, the southwest, the bottom left uh, of this map, and a number of smaller islands uh, uh, in there, um, which, which you, you can see in the, uh, in the beautiful photograph. Um, now, the Aboriginal people who live in this area and have done so for you know, tens of thousands of years are called the Lardil people, um, and they have a story about the origin of this landscape. The story goes something like this. In the beginning, our home islands, now called the North Wellesley Islands, were not islands at all, but part of a peninsula running out from the mainland. Our people say that the channels, and you can see the channels there, the grooves in the sea floor, were caused by Gan Gur, a seagull woman who dragged a big raft back and forth across the peninsula and severed the neck of the peninsula so that it didn't age for these stories. Um, and this one is not is not unique, as, as I'll explain uh, later on. So, and, and here are some of the people who tell these stories, who are not literate, who can't necessarily read or write, but who have um, 
a lot of knowledge stored in their heads that they convey to people, um, usually of the younger generation, who then pass it on um, uh, along the river of time, if you like. So these kinds of stories, I would argue, can remain understandable for thousands of years. Um, we've seen an example from the Western United States where stories have survived for 7,600 years, from Australia for more than 7,000 years. So why not from Scotland? for more than 7,000 years. Um, and I did uh, outline a lot of this in my 2018 book, uh, the, the Edge of Memory. Um, and uh, there's not a lot in there on Scotland. There's a, there's a bit, but uh, um, it's, it's mostly focused on the Australian stories, but then it, it dips into stories from other parts of the world to demonstrate an equivalent longevity. So why was oral knowledge preserved so long? Why was it preserved for thousands of years? Well, for the same reason that we educate people today, um, to give them the best chance of surviving um, an uncertain future. The idea is that if you know what happened in the past, you know what to do if the same thing happened again, or you develop cultural protocols that uh, you believe help prevent it happening again. And that's what we see in many parts of the world today. Um, and it was more common, of course, in the past. So, you know, every year people climb Mount Bromo uh, in um, Indonesia, you know, to offer sacrifices to the gods, to um, request that uh, if the volcano erupts, at least it doesn't erupt over the lands that belong to these people. Um, and it was the same thing with Kluti wells uh, in, in Celtic cultures. Um, Offerings were made because these offerings were, it was believed these offerings could influence the will of the gods and the actions of the gods. Um, and this is a recurrent theme in many cultures around the world. And I think the important thing to understand is that, you know, today when we talk about storytelling, we think of something entertaining or something relaxing. Oral instruction in pre-literate societies was a rigid and uncompromising process. It wasn't always a lot of fun, um, but people had to learn in order to optimize their chances of survival. And then along came literacy. People learned how to read and write. And in most parts of the world, mass literacy in the last 100, 200 years, it led to the loss of thousands of years of oral uh, knowledge. Um, some of that oral knowledge remains, but um, a lot of it is um, often misinterpreted. So we think of stories along with myth and legend as being products of imagination, as, as being entertainments. And, you know, there are countless books out there, not just about Scottish myths and legends, countless books that um, talk about myths and legends um, and imply that they are cultural inventions. Um, and because we think of them as cultural inventions, we think, well, how did our pre-literate um, ancestors survive? It must have been by luck. Um, it, it must have been fortuitous because they clearly had no ability, at least that we know about, to combat uh, uncertainty. Um, and I would argue that not only have today we repurposed storytelling, um, but also things like art and poetry and dance and song, all of which I would say began um, as pragmatic ways of communicating knowledge, information in oral societies. Um, so we think of dance, we think of rock art as, as being cultural products. Uh, and of course they are in a way. But they had a purpose, a purpose which um, we've largely forgotten today. And uh, our diminishment of this is something that in the edge of memory I call the tyranny of literacy. What I want to do today is to talk about five things. Um, first of all, I want to talk about what Scotland was like during the last ice age, but particularly uh, in its aftermath. Then I want to talk about how, after the last Ice Age, Scotland was gradually repeopled and what changes in the landscape, particularly coastal landscapes, um, those people uh, subsequently witnessed. In some parts of Scotland, the land emerged, it rose, and people witnessed that. These are what I call the emergent stories. 
and in other places the ocean rose up across the land and flooded it. And these are what I call the submergent stories, and I'll talk about both of those in turn. And I will end up with asking the question, or well, answering the question, how old are these stories? So what is the longevity of Scottish memory? Um, what parallels exist? And what are the implications of this? Because I think um, we're really only scratching at the surface of understanding the implications of um, humans in oral societies having such long memories. So let me start off by talking about Scotland during the last ice age and uh, its aftermath. Um, it might get a bit sciencey here, but don't worry, it's not going to be sciencey for um, the next uh, 30 minutes. The last great, great ice age, so this is a curve of changing temperature, and you can see the coldest time of the last ice age um, was around about 18, 17,000 uh, years ago. Um, before 1950. And after that time, temperatures rose um, and they rose quite rapidly um, up until about, what, eight, nine, ten thousand years. And they've remained pretty steady since then um, up until a very short time ago um, when they've, they've shot up. So that um, is something we call the last glacial maximum around about 22,000 to 18,000 years ago. Um, and then there was a period of rapid post-glacial warming. Um, and the rapid warming we see today is at that end of the graph there. So Scotland during the last ice age was covered with ice. There was no one living there. Um, and uh, I don't want to go into the details of this particular map, but it shows the extent of ice at 27,000 years ago, 23,000 years ago, and 17,000 years ago. Uh, and in, at all of those times, um, Scotland, including the islands offshore, was covered with ice. Um, as, as you can see there, it's, it's like looking, looking uh, at your country through a, through a veil. When that ice melted, because temperatures were starting to rise, um, all the water from the melted ice poured into the ocean, more or less, and that caused the ocean surface to start rising quite rapidly. So you'll see there's a slight lag compared to the temperature. So the sea level rise, the rapid sea level rise at the end of the last ice age begins globally around 15,000 years ago. Um, and in most parts of the world, it comes to a halt um, around about seven or eight thousand years ago. Um, so that's the general picture of the last ice age. But it's a bit complicated uh, in places like Scotland, which were covered by ice, because where that ice was really thick and it became melted, a great weight was lifted from the land. So the land rebounded uh, and moved upwards like this. And you can see that in the right-hand graph there from the Clyde River estuary. Um, at no time since the end of the last ice age has the ocean surface been lower um, than it is today relative to the land. It's not because the sea level hasn't been rising, it has. It's just that the land has been rising faster. So in places like the Clyde River estuary, there has been net emergence of the land. Um, relative to sea level since the last ice age. But the Outer Hebrides, um, St Kilda, Harris, Harris and the Uists, um, th this is a more representative situation of most parts of the world, where during the last ice age, the ocean surface was much lower than today. And as warming took place, the ice melted uh, and the ocean surface rose, flooding the, the land and changing coastal geographies. And these two things are still reflected today in Scotland. So the graph, sorry, not the graph, the map on the left shows what um, the ocean surface is doing today relative to the land. So in most parts of Scotland, the land is still rising slightly faster than the ocean surface is, uh, is rising. Um, so you, you can see from the contours on there, which are in millimeters per year, um, you, you can see how it how it looks. But I don't really want to dwell on that. That's uh, um, that's a bit of a digression. 
So let me move on to the second part of my talk, when Scotland was repeopled after the Ice Age. Who were the first people back in Scotland and what landscape changes did they witness? So when the ice cleared from uh, the, the ice cleared first, of course, from places where it had been thinnest, not where it had been thickest. Um, so that was along the fringes um, of the ice sheets that I showed in my earlier map. And the earliest record of people um, living in Scotland um, is about 14,500 years ago. Um, I use the term BP before present, which is uh, commonly used with radiocarbon dating and present is the year AD or 1950 or 1950 CE. So we have um, two records of people on what is today the Scottish mainland around that time. Um, certainly uh, within a few hundred years, um, people had got into the Hebrides, um, probably almost certainly coming from the north, uh, it's thought, um, and had occupied uh, various places uh, in the Hebrides and along what is today the western coast of mainland Scotland. There was a slight uh, ice advance um, around 11,000 years ago, which in Scotland is called the Loch Lomond uh, Ice Readvance. Uh, elsewhere in the world, it's called the Younger Dryas Cooling. Um, but after that time, people had pretty much occupied the whole of the coast uh, of Scotland. So we have the potential, at least, for eyewitness accounts of memorable landscape changes in Scotland. Um, and uh, those eyewitnesses um, would have been around 14,500 years ago um, in some places, but almost everywhere, uh, nine to 10,000 uh, years ago. Within the last 5,000 years or so, 5,200 years ago, this is what they would have witnessed uh, in this particular map here. So this shows um, the elevations of the Blair Drummond uh, shoreline, and don't worry too much about that. So basically what it shows is how the land has moved relative to the ocean within the last 5,000 years or so. So you can see the only places um, which have not emerged are in the Outer Hebrides the Uists, Harris and Kilda, uh, places like that. Um, and there's been comparatively little emergence, um, you know, as you get, um, as you move inwards. Uh, and then when you get right to the center, um, there's been substantial uh, emergence. So people in the Outer Hebrides and Orkney Shetland would have witnessed submergence, while people elsewhere would have witnessed various degrees of emergence. For example, in the Firth of Forth, um, Emergence has been between six and eight meters in the last 5,000 years. The land has shot up in that time. That's a very memorable thing, something that people would undoubtedly have encoded in their oral traditions. Um, and uh, down there in uh, Lockar Moss, um, emergence of about four meters has occurred within the last 5,000 years. And there are many stories about that that I'll come to in just a minute. Um, the case studies that I'm going to talk about today are, are, are in bold. So let me start with emergent stories. So within the last 5,000 years or so, there are stories that are likely to represent, in my view, eyewitness reports of memorable uh, land emergence. Um, and the first one comes from Lockar Moss um, down there. Um, then there are hill forts at Dunad and Dumbarton, um, the sheltered uh, harbours on uh, egg and uh, sky, um, and finally, um, uh, uh, further north on the Lack of Moray. Let's start with Solway Firth and Lockar Moss, uh, and we'll go back to our rhyme, um, possibly representing a memory of events that occurred more than 7,000 uh, years ago. And many of the stories associated um, with this um, talk about the kinds of things that Ravi Burns talked about in Tamashanta, the, the wild horseback hunts when out the hellish legion salad. Um, very, very moving uh, words. Um, and some of these uh, 
in the context of Lokar Moss were known as the Halamas Raids, and they were presided over by someone called the Gaia Karlin um, in this uh, particular area. Um, an 1810 account of the Gaia Karlin described this as a, this celebrated person as near akin to Satan himself, who carried a wand which could convert water into rocks and sea into solid land. And that's the key detail, of course. Um, and one day the Gaia Colleen provoked, stretched over the sea her rod of power and turned its high waves into a quagmire. Um, and this story, I suggest, likely refers to the emergence of all the mosses, all the marshes from Kanzalak to Lokha uh, and recalls their emergence within the last 5,000 years or so. Jumping onto the second case study at Dumbarton Rock and Dunad, um, these places um, both represent famous hill forts, um, the origins of which are still uh, not entirely clear. But what we do know is that when these hill forts were established, both these sites were surrounded by sea, which was a hugely important defensive attribute. Um, but as the land emerged in these places, um, which it did once uh, they had been initially fortified, they became part of the mainland. And as today, they lost their key defensive attribute. And that may be then why they uh, were successfully besieged and overtaken. Um, in the case of Dunbarton Rock by the Norse in AD uh, 870, um, by which time most of the surrounding ocean had shallowed to the point that people could walk across at low tide. And Dunad, um, of course, today kilometers in land, it emerged from the sea, um, we're not quite sure uh, when, but certainly by the time it was besieged and taken by the Picts, um, it, it was um, it was pretty much like it looks today. So um, a very uh, easy fortified site to um, besiege and, uh, and overwhelm. The uh, sheltered harbors on Egg and Sky in the Inner Hebrides, um, we don't have stories of these, but I bet there were stories um, at some point. Um, but in the 1870s on Egg, um, pieces of a Norse longship were recovered when draining this particular marsh. Um, this is Colin and Paula Martin's uh, work. Um, and it seems clear that this place was formerly used by the Norse as a winter harbour, but now the land has emerged a total of 10 metres, so quite substantial uh, emergence. And the same thing um, on the island of Skye, again in the Inner, inner Hebrides, where locks like uh, this one here had canals that the Norse had built in order to move their ships, um, uh, uh, float their ships into the lock at high tide. Um, but even during the period of Norse canal usage, AD 800 to 1200, the land emerged 50 centimetres, which meant you could no longer float um, deep draft ships uh, it, it, at high tide into the lock. So some of those um, were um, required the construction of boathouses called noosts. Um, and this is uh, Tom Gardner's uh, beautiful photograph here. Uh, and then the last case study for the emergent stories is of the Lake of Moray. Um, today, there's no uh, lake there, there's no lock there. It, it looks something like that. It's, it's fertile farmland. But if you go back to even the 1730s, you can see there was a sizable uh, lake there, uh, Lake Spiny. Um, and uh, there were also some uh, some minor lakes and uh, uh, inlets across to the uh, uh, the west as well. Uh, two key landmarks were Spiny Palace and Duffus Castle. Um, today, this is what the geography of the area looks like. There are um, no substantial uh, lakes. Um, but if you go back to medieval times, 500 uh, years or so ago, Loch Spiny was a very conspicuous part um, of uh, this landscape. Um, and if you, uh, sorry, um, and they eventually drained Loch Spiny, um, paving the way for um, the creation of the, the fertile farmland that we find there today. But if we go back even further to early Norse times, um, when the Norse established themselves at Berghead in AD 18, sorry, AD 884, um, their ships anchored in what became Loch Spiny. Uh, 
um, and that was described then as an inlet of the sea extending to Rose Isle. So it may have looked something like that. It's quite an imaginative uh, reinterpretation. Um, I, I use a lot of Michael Stratagos's uh, uh, work uh, here. Anyhow, the point here is that all the ancient stories of land emergence in Scotland come from places where the land has actually emerged in the last 5,000 years or so. Uh, and that's a really important point to, um, to to bear in mind as we move on to talk about submergent stories. Um, submergent stories are really the ones that I have uh, focused mostly on because they are easier to put uh, minimum ages on and they are uh, ubiquitous um, along um, most of the world's coasts. So within the last 5,000 years or so, um, there are stories from Scotland that plausibly represent eyewitness reports of memorable land submergence. Um, and they come uh, from the places where land has largely submerged, the Uists, um, from Harris, um, and from St Kilda. Uh, and I'll talk about each of these uh, in turn. Um, and I get very excited about these stories because um, I think that they are uh, among some of the most compelling stories from Scotland. Um, for making the case that these are not in fact inventions, but in fact represent memories uh, of what actually happened in particular places thousands of years ago. So let me start with the Monarch or the Heska Islands uh, um, off the uh, coast of North Uist, um, uh, off the southwest uh, coast of North Uist, um, and oral direct traditions collected in the 1860s um, by Alexander Carmichael um, and others um, recall when these islands were once connected to the North Uist mainland and people walked back and forth. Um, they were contiguous um, and this is what it looks like today. It's, it's a sizable gap and, and this quote is from um, Alexander Carmichael but he's talking to a, a, a lady from uh, the monarchs called uh, Mary Mackay. The isthmus had a name um, and it was partly through the gradual subsidence of the land and partly owing to the gradual dislodgement of the sand forming the isthmus that it gave way to fords and the fords broadened into a strait and tradition still mentions the names of those who crossed, the, crossed these fords last and the names of the people who drowned in crossing. This is a very powerful memory. Um, this is something with substance. It's not something superficial. And it's typical of what is often preserved in oral or preliterate societies. Um, another example from um, this area comes from uh, Bailshare and Kirkibost. Um, and Bailshare means East Village. Um, and it's possible that the West Village is now submerged. And there are stories of ruined buildings off the west coast of this island. Um, and nearby Kirkibost, um, in 1845, there's a report how so much of it was actually um, destroyed and the sea occupied fields which formerly produced fine crops of bear or barley. Um, and then uh, the islands of Bernere and Pabe, um, up here uh, in the Sound of Harris. Um, in 1935, an Oxford-trained ecologist called Charles Elton undertook a lot of research uh, in, these, uh, in these islands, and he combined his observations with stories that local residents told him. Um, and one story told me personally by three different men was of an interesting and deeply grounded tradition that in former times, these two islands were separated only by a very narrow channel so that people could shout across and be heard, even throw things across. Well, you couldn't do that today. Um, and I would argue that this story is likely to be based on recollections of submergence of what is now, um, you know, a 3.5 kilometer ocean gap. And then further north, um, Taranse and Harris, um, around the year 1800, a story was told um, by John McLennan um, that recalled when a tongue of land from Taranse almost joined the mainland. And it was so broad that it took the tenants from Tarase a week to plough it, um, and so on and so on. Um, so you, you get the idea. This is what the, the gap looks like uh, looks like today. Okay, so um, 
Finally, the story from Harris and uh, St Kilda. Um, this is the island of St Kilda, um, perhaps one of the um, more remote uh, places uh, in the Outer Hebrides. Oh, undoubtedly, one of the more remote places um, doesn't have a permanent uh, uh, population today. The earliest written account of St Kilda was in the year 1752 by someone called Martin Martin. Um, and that's the title page of his book. And this is uh, uh, page 15. And I want to draw your attention to page 15 because there's some very interesting things here. Um, the first quote at the top says, Upon the west side of this island lies a valley, which piece of ground is called by the inhabitants the Female Warriors Glen. This Amazon is famous in their traditions. Her house is yet extant. The second quote, they will tell you that she was much addicted to hunting and that in, that in her days, all the space between this isle and that of Harris was one continued tract of dry land. It is said of this warrior that she let loose her greyhounds after the deer in St Kilda, making their course towards the opposite islands. Now, Martin was a bit dubious about this information, so he didn't record these stories in any great detail, which I think is a great shame, because I would argue that these kinds of stories are very unlikely to be inventions. If you wanted to invent a story, why would you invent something like this? So I would argue that they perhaps, um, no, more than that, they probably represent uh, memories of a time when the sea level was lower, maybe thousands of years ago, and maybe it was possible to move between the two islands, or maybe it was possible to almost move between the two islands. There are similar stories from the island of Harris, um, a long and involved legend of a female warrior, again, not recorded in any great detail, um, who used to hunt across the land, the dry land, between the Long Island and St Kilda. And more specifically, according to local tradition, this land is said to have linked St Kilda with the Long Island. Um, and uh, it might have been a, a lady that looked something like this. So submergent stories from Scotland um, all come from places where land submergence has occurred. And that again is an important point, I think. There should be similar stories from Auckland and Shetland, um, but I haven't been able to find them. Um, maybe uh, you know of some, or maybe you could think about looking for some. But the point here is that ancient stories of land emergence come only from places that have emerged and so stories of land submergent come only from places that have gone underwater. The agreement is perfect. And I think this tells us that Scottish stories of this kind are not invented. We are wrong to dismiss them as myth or legend. Rather, they represent ancient people's observations of coastal change and the explanations they derived for this. These stories are science. So the last part of what I want to talk about today, and I'm going to be, I'm afraid, another 10 minutes or so, um, how old are these stories? What, what is the longevity of Scottish memory, its parallels and its implications? Well, without going into a huge amount of detail, um, at each of the uh, emergence sites, um, these are the graphs of relative sea level change, sea level change relative to the land over the last 16 to 20,000 years. So, for example, if we assume that stories about Lockhart Moss involve emergence of three to five meters. Um, that gives us a minimum age for these stories of 5,800 to 6,000 uh, years. That means these stories must have survived this long if they are based on observations um, of the natural environment, which I would suggest they probably are. And it's similar with the submergent stories. So, um, uh, if we assume, for example, that the stories about when the Monarch Islands were last connected by dry land to North Uist, um, if we assume that involves a minimum shoreline emergence of seven meters, somewhere around there, that gives us a minimum age for these stories of 7,120 years ago, meaning that those stories have been passed down by word of mouth over more than seven millennia to reach us today. Um, 
So are these ages unprecedented? Well, they're not. The, rose, the most robust data set, com comparison uh, data set comes from Australia, where there are now 32 groups of stories, There's only 21 of them shown here um, because it's, it's, it's multiplying all the time. But we now have 32 groups of stories about a time in the past when sea level was much lower, when shorelines were much further out to sea and what are today islands were contiguous with the mainland. Um, Australia is almost the size, same size as Europe, okay? And we've got stories all the way around the coast of Australia. Um, people arrived in Australia about 70,000 years ago and those people have remained largely isolated since that time. So they've witnessed an almost 23% reduction in the area of land of Australia um, resulting from post-glacial sea level rise. So it's a perfect storm, if you like, of culture intersecting with landscape change. And coastal land loss was no doubt traumatizing, a very um, apt subject for oral traditions. I've given you one example, I'll give you one more um, from Kangaroo Island here in the south of Australia. The stories of Kangaroo Island and the adjacent Fleurier Peninsula on the Australian mainland, um, most of those stories involve a person called Gurunduri, and he chased or followed his two wives who were running away from him along the south coast of the Fleurier Peninsula. When they reached what is today the water gap between the mainland and Kangaroo Island, they managed to cross Baxter's Passage uh, by a process of walking and wading. When Gurunduri caught up with them, he summoned the waves to rise up and drown them, and their bodies were washed south and became the islands that you can see on the map known as the Pages. And since this time, Backstairs Passage has been submerged. Um, and I've got a big project at the moment with some of the indigenous knowledge holders of this area. And we have um, estimate, or we estimate that the story would have been true, last would have been true just over 10,000 years ago. So here we have an indigenous Aboriginal memory that has lasted for more than 10 millennia. Um, another compelling data set comes from Northwest Europe, um, not your part of Northwest Europe, but a little bit further south, um, where there are many stories about cities under the sea, and some of those places are marked by the red crosses here on the map. Um, and I've been working with um, Breton uh, archaeologists and anthropologists on this for a, for a few years. Um, many such of stories are, of course, um, considered and fiercely defended as, as cultural productions rather than authentic memories. Um, let me just give you one example from the, the city of Is, um, commonly located in the uh, Bay de Duanene um, on the western coast of Brittany. Um, this is the area, um, and uh, sometimes in the Bay de Duanene, sometimes in the Bay de Trepas, um, it, there are different versions of, of the story. But most versions of the story picture East as being a city um, that became uh, overwhelmed by the sea uh, as the result of the, um, the misdeeds, if you like, of uh, Dahu, who was the princess, the daughter of King uh, Gradlian, um, who is a very well known uh, <clears throat> figure in the traditions of this part of, uh, of Brittany. And, and without going into great detail, um, it was believed that <clears throat> uh, East, which was surrounded by floodgates, um, Dahut managed to uh, unlock the floodgates when the tide was high, let the water into the city and caused the city to become submerged. Um, and this memory was so well preserved 200 years or so ago that church services were regularly held about above the place where they believed its remains could be uh, could be seen in the Bay de Duanene. Um, and if that story is correct and East is now, let's say, 15 meters or so under the ocean surface, then the story has to be a minimum of 8,750 uh, years old. So comparative ages of ancient submergent stories, let's look first at Scotland. Um, the stories that we calculate appear to be between 2000 and um, 
uh, slightly over or almost uh, 8,700 years ago. Um, and this was all written up in my paper in the Scottish Geographical Journal uh, earlier this year. Um, in Australia, we have um, comparable stories, but submergent stories only, um, going back more than 7,000 years and some perhaps reaching an incredible 13,000 years ago. And this was work that we first published, myself and Nick Reed, an Aboriginal linguist, um, in the Australian Geographer in 2016. Um, and the work that we've been doing in other parts of Northwest Europe, um, we've got stories from Brittany, uh, Cornwall, Wales, more than 5,000 years ago, perhaps going back more than 11,000 years ago. And we published a, this at the end of last year uh, in uh, Geoarchaeology, um, we tried seven journals and we were turned down by seven journals before geoarchaeology finally uh, accepted this uh, paper. So um, th this is not an easy topic to, um, to sort of profile, if you like. Um, but there are many implications of stories with this kind of longevity, and I don't have the time today to go into um, some of those uh, implications. But I think the main one is that we have clearly underestimated the abilities of our pre-literate ancestors to, to encode and organize and communicate uh, knowledge of what they witnessed sometimes thousands of years ago. Uh, and I think that what I would end up with is a plea to say, well, let's have another look at these stories that we typically dismiss as myth and legend and see whether there is not perhaps some kind of empirical foundation um, in, these, uh, in these stories. So look, thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to, to take questions, of course. Perfect, thank you very much, Patrick. Really okay. fascinating stuff and, and so many angles and and strands there that cross a, across the uh, sorry cuts across sorry uh disciplinary boundaries so i've got no doubt that there's there's plenty of questions and, and the chat's already filling up um so i would just say to everyone if you do have questions please feel free to, to pop them in the chat and we'll we'll address them um we've got a few um comments on on bits and pieces so far um there's a couple from Stuart angus who's just um mentioned that i think in relation to your your first um, one of your first points that in Rennie and Hansen, uh, 2011, that they've established that no part of Scotland's coast is now free from relative sea level rise. Um, Stuart's also added in bits later on. Um, perhaps we can kind of summarise this in, in Stuart's next point where he's he said that although valuing these traditions, I fear uh, that great caution is required. The story that um, Conor Bolognus uh, was introduced to Eriske by uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie does not explain why it's also on um, Vattersea. Uh, there's also a written account of the history of used by Reverend Ang Angus uh, MacDonald, uh, who claimed that he had personally seen a man delivering cuddies to uh, Nanton by boat, but a surveyed map uh, dated 1805 established that this could not have been possible during his lifetime. But having said that, uh, he, he could also cite stories of scientific findings for use being debunked by uh, locals, which I think you were you were touching upon there at the, at the end of the talk. I don't know if you want to comment upon uh, any of that, Patrick. Well, look, thanks, thanks, Andrew, and thank you, Stuart. I, I think <clears throat> I, I think it's a mistake to to try and not throw out the baby with the bathwater, but um, to, to actually um, say, well. You know, there are some doubts about this particular story um, or about this particular detail and therefore your whole argument uh, collapses. Um, it was never my intention to to do anything more than to illustrate my basic point that ancient stories have endured for millennia in pre-literate contexts across the world including Scotland. Um, and look, I, I'm, a, I'm a great admirer of Stuart Angus's uh, uh, research, and I'm quite happy to be educated by him or, or anyone else about um, about other stories uh, and about things that I, I may have, um, you know, misread. But, you know, again, I think the I think the general point is absolutely clear. Um, 
I, I, Andrew, I saw something pop up in the chat. I mean, I wasn't looking at the chat about giants. Um, and I wondered if I could just quickly say something about. Of course, giants, yeah, because yeah, I've, sure. I've written something about that before. Um, let, let me put this to you that, you know, in let, let's, let's take um, the Monarch Islands and North Uist. Um, you know, if, if you remember a time when there was a land connection between those two islands and people could walk across, and then if the sea level rose and drowned that land connection, then how would you, how would you communicate your memory of that history to people, uh, you know, later on to, to younger people? Well, you would tell them, oh yes, there used to be a land connection here. Uh, and after a while, after a few hundred years, they're going to start thinking, well, yeah, um, you don't really expect me to believe this. So to authenticate those kinds of narratives, people said, yes, but in those days, people were giants. They could walk across these water gaps. Um, they could actually straddle, um, you know, kilometers of open ocean. That's how these stories are true. So I actually believe um, and I've, I've done some work on, not work, I've done some research on this in Wales and particularly in, uh, in Northern Ireland, um, actually looking at stories about giants and trying to um, link them back to a time when people could cross between, uh, you know, over what are now ocean gaps, they could walk across these things. Um, so I think there's a lot of sort of post narrative rationalization involved in things like uh, like stories about giants and of course once you introduce giants into popular culture then they can be used for all sorts of things no that's very interesting and actually just to pick up on that that was um jennifer mcknight that's, that's popped out in in the the chat and she suggested exactly what you've gone on to explain there that you know could this be uh, almost myths being used to explain and preserve memory of real life events um, and, and then how that, that's manifested later on. Um, just on, on the point of giants, Lynn has just popped, Lynn Campbell's just popped in, in the chat that um, giants are, are part of a creation story in Orkney um, that tell about how the two biggest locks uh, on the mainland were made and how the hills of Hoy uh, are also so high. So there's certainly maybe um, something in that to explore. And also Lynn mentioned when you were um, talking about the, the, the lack of these uh, emergent submergent stories in Orkney, or sorry, not the lack, but just the, not the fact that they've been identified. Um, Lynn said that there's an Orcadian story about a city at the bottom of the sea. So that, again, that could be a consistent thread uh, across the, the Western and, um, and Northern Isles. Fantastic. Um, yeah, Jennifer's just commented on that, that earlier point about the giants, just in conjunction uh, with myths about uh, large individuals too, and highlighting Cubby Roo, um, it could become very convincing. Uh, I'm just quickly scanning through the, the chat, folks, so please do keep the, the questions coming. We've got a lot in here. I'm just making sure that we don't uh, we don't miss anyone. Um, a, a point by um, Chris Thompson, who's um, when you were talking about the, the Pictish women, um, saying that stories of the Scottish warrior women exist in early Irish texts, uh, but she's generally located in Skye, interestingly. Um, Another point by uh, Stuart, just saying that it's widely believed still um, that, that of the stories um, about Colvin being engulfed by sand in a single night, uh, which was uh, debunked by Sinclair Ross. Uh, we've got another question from uh, Donna, who's asked, uh, how do specific tales of submerged lands map onto wider tales of great floods like Noah's, which occur in nearly every religious or oral tradition? That's a really good question, and I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to answer that. So the two types of stories are quite different um, in my view. So, um, and this became clear when we were looking at the Australian stories. When, when I first read those stories, I thought, yes, they were flood stories, you know, of a time when the water moved onto the land and later receded, um, but they're not. They're, they're times when the water moved gradually onto the land and, and stayed there. So they are inundation stories and not flood stories. Mm -hmm. And th there's a very important distinction here. And that's, I think, how we were, well, I think that's how we were able to put um, minimum ages on 
the stories from Australia is because we realised they had to be inundation stories rather than, than simply uh, temporary flood stories. Now, that said, um, I don't doubt that, you know, in many places uh, that the, the two types of stories have um, have merged and have um, sort of informed each other. But uh, Australia, and I'm sorry to keep talking about Australia when, when I'm in Scotland, but, um, you know, Australia is such a perfect place for um, recording these types of stories because the culture has been essentially untouched for, you know, 70,000 years or so. Um, whereas everywhere else in the world has had all sorts of cultural syncretism going on, um, which means that stories have become overprinted by other people's stories. But in Australia, they haven't. Um, so um, it's a really good place to actually, you know, sort of get a baseline for, for this kind of thing. Um, yeah, so, so look, a good Good question there. I might actually have used my position as, as chair to kind of follow up on that because something I was thinking of uh, when you were talking about Locker Moss, um, you know, th this figure of the, the Guy Arcoli, uh, who, you know, is described as this satanic figure. Obviously, these these events that you're talking about long predate Christianity and, and things like that. So do you have, is it quite common to find these stories of natural events coming in a variety of different versions which reflect kind of contextual transformations and, and changing understandings of, of the world, essentially? That, that's a really good question. Um, I suppose the short answer is, is yes. <clears throat> I, I would just make the point that as soon as you write down an oral tradition, then its, its dynamism is remo removed. So um, I've done a lot of, I spent a lot of my uh, research career in the Pacific Islands and, um, you know, working with a lot of oral traditions there. And you can go into different communities and you can hear four or five different versions of the same story. As soon as you write that story down, um, that becomes the version of the story. Yeah. Uh, and it may not even have been the sort of, you know, the, the common version. Um, so, you know, in a way, literacy has remove the dynamic nature of storytelling of that kind. So it's very difficult to reconstruct and to answer the kinds of questions that, you know, that you've just mm -hmm. answered there, Andrew. Um, yeah, so, um, but look, the, the stories of the guy, Carleen, um, at Lockar Moss, are, you know, clearly there are parallels with other places in Scotland. Clearly there are parallels with um, with Norse uh, stories and things like that. Um, so there there has undoubtedly been, um, you know, interweaving uh, of these traditions. Um, yeah. Yeah, excellent. No, it, it's really interesting. And I, I, that's a really good point about as soon as it's written, the dynamism uh, ceases. And you can definitely see that in, in other contexts when looking at this kind of uh, oral tradition material. Um, just a point um, from Stuart in the chat, um, just following up on um, what we were discussing earlier, just to say that you didn't um, intend to dismiss the value of preserving these tales, quite the, quite the reverse, and that it strikes him that um, we, and he includes himself in this, can sometimes be too ready to endorse these from other sources. Uh, and he's provided a, an example there from uh, North Uist um, you can't find, it's not at present, but I've been told that there are, um, that there is a more ordinary translation. I still think that North Uist once extended further west, and I'm, I'm looking for more evidence. So perhaps there, that, that's maybe a, a chat over a coffee or a, a Zoom pint at some point that's in the making there. I look forward to it. That there are some very interesting stories about Loch Pybel. Uh, on the west coast of North Uist, um, you know, and, and about, um, b because people drained a lot of those locks, but before that, um, you know, the, the, the ocean was moving onto the land and there's all sorts of islands offshore that used to be sheep pastures and things mm. like that. Um, and and what, what I think is a very useful line of evidence are place names. So, um, you know, very often a lot of the um, the older texts give a whole range of place names that have today been forgotten. And, and those place names often um, contain, you know, a lot of meaning, uh, you know, about the history of particular places, um, obviously not just in Scotland, but I mean, ev everywhere in the world. Mm. No, absolutely. 
Um, just on a, you've just jogged my memory that there was another point in the chat from earlier on that I don't think I mentioned. Um, a comment from Ruth Wilson, um, just in relation when you were talking about uh, Pabby, about uh, the, that stretch of water that is three and a half kilometres, I think you said, now that which wasn't. Uh, and just to say that she said that she's heard similar stories from people on Bernsey, so that on, on, the other, on the other island. So that's quite interesting there. Um, we do still have a few minutes, folks. If anyone does have any other questions, I'll just leave that open to the floor. Looks like there's lots of uh, discussions to be had and email chains to be created after <laughs> after this discussion, Patrick. I'll perhaps abuse my position once more, uh, as is my want. Um, uh, just when you were you were mentioning there about the, the connections between the examples from Scotland and, and elsewhere, um, and obviously a, lo a lot of the material that you've got in comparison is coming from Australia. But is it fair to say that this is a almost a global kind of phenomenon where no matter where you're looking around coastal areas, you're seeing these kind of oral traditions being preserved? Oh, absolutely. Um, so I've I've got a new project that's just uh, kicking off uh, in India, um, and I've got a really good uh, uh, Indian uh, collaborator that that I'm working with, and uh, um, and there is there is a host of stories there about cities under the sea, and uh, and and it's all um, it's all tied up in in the Mahabharata and, uh, and and other sort of uh, Hindu um, holy books and and texts and things like that. So there's a huge amount of information there um, that, you know, that there's always been this division, I think, in India between, um, you know, science, which is essentially Western science and, and tradition, which is culturally grounded. And, and um, nobody has really done much they've done some but not done much on on bringing the two together so i think there's you know a huge potential there um i i am going to you know continue my work with my collaborators in in Brittany, um in particular um people like uh, axel creech and uh, um at the uh, at the um at, at Nantes University and places like that, where we've been looking at a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, ancient uh, stories there. there. There was one that someone sent me the other day and it, and it talked about how there used to be a procession from the mainland out to this place that is now an island. Um, there, there used to be a church procession every year um, that, that went out there and there's still a sort of line of stones marking the route that they took, which is now, of course, under mm. sort of two or three uh, meters of water. So, you know, these kinds of stories, uh, I think, are, are out there. And um, I, I think it's incumbent on, you know, anyone who is curious about, you know, deep history to to interrogate these wherever they see an opportunity. Um, and just to just to sort of go back to to Orkney and Shetland, um, uh, I, I'm sure there are stories there, but I, I um, you know, from the other side of the world have, have been hard pressed to to find them. But I would love to see someone, um, you know, actually sort of pick up this gauntlet and run mm. with it and, and, and actually do some uh, some original uh, analysis of, of those stories as well. Absolutely. Um, just I've just seen there's a couple of things just popped up in the chat there. Um, Jennifer's just said that, that there's a really good um, article um, on place names of Mole by Alistair White, uh, which might be of interest. Um, and then a question from uh, Sally Garden. Um, Thank you for your stimulating paper. Questions about the veracity of specific traditions are really questions about orality and, and the mode of transmission. We know that song and ballad uh, sorry, we know from song and ballad that narratives are often relocated in both time and place. But this does not undermine at all the thesis you present that memory is long lasting. Fascinating work, and thank you. I don't know if there's um, you want to comment upon that, Patrick. Well, I, I agree. I agree entirely. Um, what we find in Australia is that rock art, in particular, um, has been recently sort of reinterpreted um, as kind of memory aids so that you know people who are struggling to remember the uh, the old stories and the instructions actually drew these uh, these things and and could refer back to them so you know again rock art you know is a, is a, a way of sort of jolting not, 
your your memory if you were in danger of forgetting something. Um, but also, I mean, I went very quickly across sort of dance and performance and poetry and things like that. Um, you know, I often say to my students, you know, you, you may not be able to remember the words of a song you heard 20 years ago, but as soon as you remember the melody, then the words come back yeah. to you. Um, you know, and I think people in oral cultures understood this very well, that if you sang something to a memorable tune, then the message of the, the song um, remained with you. So, you know, again, I think we've just scratched the surface, um, but I think there's a lot more to do. Absolutely. That's maybe a, a good point to to wrap things up then, and we can, <laughs> we can invite <laughs> everyone to contribute to that, that wider debate uh, later on. Um, yeah, just a message from Stuart saying they're great talking. He looks forward to that pint at some point. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so, so I've maybe enlisted you in, in a, a noble effort there. But um, <laughs> all that's left for me to do is just to thank everyone for, for attending this afternoon. And a, a massive thank you to Patrick for giving up his time, especially in the evening, to, to come and talk to us uh, for a really fantastic paper. And I know that there's going to be uh, lots of emails being fired off in the aftermath of this. Um, so I wonder if everyone could join me in the standard awkward um, WebEx meeting round of applause for Stuart and I'll, I'll lead the charge <laughs> but um thank you but, so yeah. much Andrew <laughs> but thank, thank you again you everyone Patrick. for coming I Absolutely. really enjoyed it thanks a lot and uh, all the details for our next Ellen's Matter seminar is uh, are on the the website for anyone interested but uh yeah just finally thank you again for everyone for coming and thank you to Patrick thanks a lot